Trapped ion quantum computing is a cutting-edge technique that utilizes charged atoms, or ions, as qubits. Here, these ions are held in space using time-varying electric potentials, whose qubit state are encoded in the internal energy levels of the individual ions. Information processing is performed through using laser beams to manipulate the ion's quantum states. Since these ions are suspended in space, they are relatively immune to environmental noise, allowing for the highest fidelity performance. In this video, we discuss the basic physics of ionizing the atom and Doppler cooling. We discuss why you cannot trap an ion with an electrostatic field, a result called Earnshaw's theorem. This then led us to the Paul trap, which allows for ions trapping using a time-varying electric field. The goal is to form a cooled ion lattice as shown, the platform for quantum computation. Our focus here will be on ions trapping, and the physics of doing quantum computation with these ions will be discussed in an upcoming video. Let's get started. Part 1. Ionizing the Atom Ions are atoms that have gained or lost electrons. The calcium ion, one of the many used for quantum computation, is shown here. The calcium atom has 20 electrons, with two valence electrons. For the calcium plus ion, one electron has been knocked out of its valence shell. While atoms are neutral particles, ions are charged particles, which makes them easier to be trapped. Neutral atoms can also be trapped, a discussion left for another time. First, we asked how are neutral atoms ionized? Imagine you have a piece of calcium in the solid state. Heating up this piece of calcium to a critical temperature makes it transition to a gaseous state where the calcium atoms are free to move around. Then, Hitting the calcium gas with a beam of high-energy electrons will knock one or two electrons off the valence shell of each calcium atom, thus ionizing it. This process is called electron ionization and is only one of the many approaches used to create ions. For trapped ion quantum computing, we shall use calcium atoms which are singly charged. Part 2. Doppler cooling Before the ions can be trapped, their thermal motion must be suppressed as much as possible. One of the methods to achieve this is called Doppler cooling. As the name suggests, it makes use of the Doppler effect. Imagine there are two lasers operating with the same frequency omega L. One is on the left side shooting photons in the positive Z direction and the other is on the right side, shooting photons in the negative Z direction. An ion with charge plus E is put in motion with velocity V heading towards the positive Z direction. The ion has a resonant frequency of omega zero, with a Lorentz and light absorption peak as shown. Here, we choose the lasers to be slightly red detuned with respect to the ion, thus, its light absorption is smaller than it would otherwise be if it resonant. According to the Doppler effect, the frequency perceived by an object moving towards its light source is higher than when it is moving away from it. Therefore, in our experimental setup, the left side laser appears to have its frequency red shifted when compared to omega L, while the right side laser appears to have its frequency blue shifted. These laser frequencies are designed such that they are all smaller than omega zero. Looking at the frequency distribution in the absorbance diagram, we can see that the photons from the right side laser, with frequency omega prime, are more often absorbed as their frequency is closer to the resonant frequency of the ion, while the photons from the left side laser, with frequency omega double prime, are less frequently absorbed. If the ion has initial momentum p equals to h bar k0, the incoming photon from the right laser that is moving in the opposite direction has momentum equal to negative h bar k gamma. After absorbing the photon, the ion will have lost some of its momentum. The ion will re-emit the photon back to the environment due to a process called spontaneous emission. However, spontaneous emission is isotropic, 
so no momentum is gained or lost. The ion's momentum is related to its kinetic energy and is related to its temperature. Multiple photon absorptions as the one described above cause the ion to cool down and it's now ready to be trapped. Part 3. Earnshaw's Theorem Imagine we have a point charge that we wish to trap in a region of space. An arbitrary electrostatic field can be established by placing free charges on the circumference of the space. Gauss's law requires that any electrostatic field will have zero divergence within the free space. A static electric field is conservative, which implies that it can be written as the gradient of a scalar field phi. This yields us the Laplace's equation. One of the properties of Laplace's equation is that its solutions does not have local minima or maxima. In other words, a potential that obeys Laplace's equation only allows at most saddle points, where the second derivatives have opposite signs in the perpendicular directions. Such a saddle potential will not be able to trap an electric charge. This is the intuition behind Earnshaw's theorem, which states that point charges cannot be maintained in stable stationary equilibrium configuration solely with an electrostatic potential. So, how can we get around this? Imagine that the saddle-like shape of the potential can now oscillate. The right plot depicts the corresponding electric fields associated with it. For ease of visualization, red means positive and blue means negative. This switching of confinement and anti-confinement in opposite directions can trap a charged particle in the center. This is the basis of the Paul trap, which we will go over in detail next. Part 4. Paul Trap Half of the Nobel Prize in Physics 1989 was awarded to Hans D. Himmelt and Wolfgang Paul for the development of the ion trap technique, now commonly known as the Paul Trap. This is the design of the linear Paul Trap. There are four rods along the Z direction, identified as A, B, C and D. The blue and red rods each have the same polarity at any given point in time. They provide an electrical potential due to their geometry but are also modulated by a time-dependent component with frequency omega. This potential will trap the ions, highlighted in green, in the xy plane. Along the z direction there are also two caps with potential vc. These caps will provide an electrostatic potential that will help complete the trapping along the z-direction. We discuss first the in-plane trapping. Let us quickly review how to obtain the electric potential produced by a charged cylindrical rod of diameter d. By Gauss's law, the electric flux through a Gaussian surface sigma is proportional to the charge enclosed in this surface. Let's construct a cylindrical Gaussian surface of diameter rho and length L. Since the electric field will point away radially due to the symmetry of the problem, the field can be taken out of the integral resulting in what we have here on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we have replaced the charge enclosed by the surface sheet density sigma times the surface area of the rod. Finally, cancelling out the terms, we arrive at the electric field, which is inversely proportional to the distance from the axis and points away from it. To obtain the electrostatic potential, we recall that it is the line integral along some path of the electric field. Since the field has cylindrical symmetry, the potential will not depend on the coordinate z or the azimuthal angle phi. Plugging in the expression for the electric field that we just found, we obtain the electrostatic potential as shown. It is proportional to the natural log of the ratio between the distance from the axis and the diameter of the rod. Returning to our problem, we have here the cross-section view of the pole trap. D is the diameter of the rods and A is the distance from each rod to the center of the trap. Note the origin of the system is not placed at any of the rods. Accounting for these differences and for the dynamical potential at the surface of the rods, this is the potential created by the rod A. 
rearranging the terms inside of the natural log, we obtain this formula. Now, with all the rods together, their individual contributions can be superimposed, and this is the sum of the potentials. Note that we are calling this potential phi quad because it is the potential of a quadruple. Next, we perform a Taylor expansion of phi quad for small x over a and y over a, that is, small deviations from the origin. This gives us the following potential highlighted in green. Note that the sign difference between the x and y coordinates will give the saddle-like shape to the potential. Here is a plot of the moving saddle potential phi quad. In what follows, we will show that the equations of motion for a particle in this potential are indeed trapped in the xy plane. Part 5. Mathieu equations and its solutions. Consider the force exerted by the Paul trap electric field on the point charges. The field is equal to the negative gradient of the potential as follows. It can be simplified to the following. Using Newton's second law, we obtain the equations of motion in the x and y directions. Next, we introduce the dimensionless parameter q. Intuitively, q gives the ratio between the applied electrostatic energy to the rotational kinetic energy. In the trapping experiment, we are in the regime where q is small. We can rewrite these equations in terms of q as follows. These are the so-called Mathieu equations, whose solutions are the Mathieu functions. The general characteristics of its solutions are known to having a slow harmonic component and a fast oscillatory one. We show here the solutions to the Mathieu equations over the course of one period. We note that the motion is composed of a slow harmonic part plus the fast micro motion. The frequency of these motions will be calculated as follows. To show this, consider the time-dependent coordinate u, which can be either x or y. We break it up into two parts. u0 is the slow motion and delta u is the fast micro motion. Substituting this in the original Mathieu equation, we obtain the following. The plus or minus sign depends on whether u stands for x or y. As illustrated previously, the Mathieu equation solutions can be approximated as follows. The acceleration of the slow motion is negligible with respect to the acceleration of the micro motion. Likewise, the amplitude of the micro motion is negligible with respect to the amplitude of the slow motion. With these considerations, we find the following differential relation between the micro motion delta u and the slow motion u0. Now, since we're assuming the micro motion is much faster, we can consider u0 of t as approximately constant and perform a double integral on both sides of this equation. Then, delta u of t is approximately equal to this expression. Now, we repeat here the original separated Mathieu equation. Substituting the expression for delta u of t that we have just found. We arrived at the following, where we are left with only the slow motion, u0 of t. Going through the simple algebra, we reduce to the following differential equation for the slow motion part, u0 of t. To solve this differential equation for u0 of t, we recall that a differential equation of the following form can be approximately solved if alpha is a much faster varying function in time than f. In this case, we can replace alpha of t by a time averaged function alpha bar of t. The time averaged cosine squared of omega t over one period is equal to one half. Hence, we obtain the following approximate differential equation. This is a known differential equation whose solution is an oscillatory function like a cosine. Thus, u0 of t is an oscillating function with frequency equal to q omega over 2 times square root of 2. 
We can go a step forward and substitute the expressions for u0 of t and delta u of t in the equation for the total motion. Obtaining the following expression. We can see that total motion has two parts. The slow motion with frequency equal to q omega over 2 times square root of 2. And a fast micro motion with frequency omega. Notice that the amplitudes of both parts are also different. While the slow motion has amplitude a, the micro motion's amplitude is a times q over 2. As long as q is less than 1, our assumptions hold true. Part 6. Paul Trap. Out of Plane Trap. Now, the next step is to trap the ions in the z direction. In the Paul Trap setup, we place two caps with surface potential Vc, separated by a distance L. The potential created by these two caps is a harmonic potential along the z direction, that is, proportional to z squared. Here, alpha is a dimensionless parameter. Summing this potential with the moving saddle that we computed, we have the total potential that traps the point charges. We can use this potential to find the equations of motion in the x, y and z directions as follows. Here, we introduce the parameters zeta and psi for simplifying the notations. Again, the equations in x and y are the Mathieu equations, and, in the z direction, we have a harmonic oscillator with frequency omega z. Therefore, the motion in the x and y direction follow the Mathieu closed orbits as we had shown before, while in the z direction, we have harmonic oscillation, successfully trapping the ion in between the four rods and the caps. Now we present a few examples of trapped ions. In this image, there are 1, 2, 3, 6 and 12 magnesium ions loaded in an ion trap. This image was taken by Seidlin and Cheverini from the National Institute of Standards and Technology in 2006. The second example shows a chain of barium ions in an ion trap. This image is from the Abacos project, led by the Ion Trap Quantum Computing Research Group at Oxford University. Finally, we show an image of trapped ytterbium ions in a linear trap. This image belongs to the Trapped Ion Quantum Technologies Group from the Physics Department at the Stockholm University in Sweden. Stay tuned, and subscribe, so you will be notified of our future episodes.